The second great feast that they were told to go celebrate was the Feast of Pentecost. What happened at Pentecost? Hmm? Tongues of fire. What was that? Yes, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So 50 days after Passover, they were to celebrate another feast, and that was called Pentecost, and that was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the third great feast was the Feast of Tabernacles, and that comes in the fall. That is a feast that has not literally been fulfilled yet, but it will be. It will be literally fulfilled when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom on the earth. Okay, so that's his second coming. We don't know much about that feast and the, the different events that happen in that feast. But we do know, because we have hindsight, we can know about the feast of Passover and the things that happened in that feast and feast of Pentecost. In Passover, they were to do Passover on day 14. Day 15 was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and this is when they were to take seven days and get rid of all the yeast in their house and clean their house. That was symbolic of just a purified life. Okay, and then there was something in there called the Wave Sheaf Offering, and this is one of the things that is incorporated in the Passover feast. So if you'll turn to Leviticus 23... Leviticus 23 is where um, God is telling Moses, these are the feasts and celebrations that I want you to celebrate throughout your generations, okay? So he outlines Feast of Passover and Unleavened Bread, and then he says in verse, well, we'll start at verse 10. It says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you enter the land which I am going to give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring in the, the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Okay, so when they get into Canaan, during their harvest time, they were supposed to go out and get the first fruit, the first sheaf of grain and bring it in. Okay, the priest would go and get it and bring it into the temple. Verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord for you to be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, one year old, without defect for a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall then be two tenths of an ephah and fine flour mixed with oil, an offering by fire to the Lord for a soothing, for a soothing aroma when its drink offered a fourth of a hen of wine. Okay, so this wave sheaf offering was supposed to happen the day after the Sabbath. Okay, now it goes on further in here, but it, it describes that when this happens, they shall count 50 days or seven Sabbaths forward, and that's when they would celebrate their next feast, which was Feast of Pentecost. So we know that the wave sheaf offering this thing where they go get the, the grain and wave it in the temple, the priests wave it in the temple, we know it happened between Passover and Pentecost, okay? So it happened right with Feast of um, Unleavened Bread and then the wave sheaf offering, okay? Now, Jesus fulfilled, like, all of these feasts, so this is how he fulfilled this feast, literally. Um, um, okay, so... All of the feasts were centered around harvest times, okay? So the first harvest of the spring was a barley harvest, okay? So Passover would have been like a barley harvest. And then Pentecost would have been a wheat harvest. And in the fall at Tabernacles is the oil and grapes, which is really signifies the new wine and the new oil. And, and it was also wheat. It was everything. It was like it's the great harvest coming, okay? So now, do you remember when Jesus, um, we're going to turn over to John 20. We're going to read when Jesus, um, Mary, goes to the garden. John 20. Okay, I'm just going to read the better part, of, like the first 18 verses. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw that the stone had already taken away the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter 
and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciples went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb where he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself so the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered and he saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead from the dead so the disciples went away again to their own homes but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping And so, as she wept, she stood and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in while sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, that I and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned, and she said in Hebrew, Rabboni, I think that's how you say that, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I will ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. So Mary goes to cling to him because she's so excited. And he says, Don't don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my Father. But we know in Luke, he tells Peter to, and and the disciples to touch him and to see that he's real. So something happened between the time he told Mary not to touch him and when, um, when he told the disciples to go for it and touch him and see that he is real. So what happened? He said he had not ascended. Well, we know that that didn't happen. Our thinking for ascension was after he had been with them for 40 days and he told them to wait in Jerusalem and he was ascended, ascended to, to heaven. So what happened, this is what I believe, and I, I believe this partly because the, the feasts are literally fulfilled. So that wave sheaf offering that the priests were to go and get out of the field and, and pr- take it to the temple and wave it as a sign that our first fruit has come in. If there's a first, what does that imply? There's a second, fourth. There's, there's things following the first, there's second, third. There's more coming. And this was partly a faith, like they knew we, we offer this offering to God and know in faith that we are going to have a harvest. A harvest is coming. And so while the priests were waving their first fruit in the temple, the day after the Sabbath, as they were instructed to do and had been doing for years, Jesus ascends to heaven and presents himself alive in heaven as the fulfillment of the wave sheaf offering. And that might not excite you, but... What's exciting about that is that he is faithful to his word and he fulfills every, every, every word that he says in his word. Every word. He is the fulfillment. He was the Passover. He was the wave sheaf offering, presenting himself as legally alive in the court of heaven while the priests are pronouncing their first fruit. Jesus, in, chap- in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus is referred to as the first fruit. So he was the first fruit of what? Of many. He was the first fruit of many 
coming to him. He was the first fruit of the harvest. And the, the promise and the hope that that gives us is that we are the harvest. There's a great harvest coming. We know we t we've been told that in scripture. But we are part of that harvest. We are part of, we get to follow in what Jesus did. Jesus was the literal first fruit of many to come after him. And, and if you look at Hebrews, and it, it just talks about like the hope that we have and clinging to the hope that we have because of what he did. In Hebrews, um, I'm just going to tell you just a few verses. Um, Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Hebrews is like a very theological book. But it's all like, it's all, it's taking the Old Testament and showing you the fulfillment of things written in history that Jesus fulfilled. Jesus became that high priest for us. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15, what he did because of his death is he rendered the enemy powerless. Like we look around and we see this onslaught of the enemy and we see what he tries to do and, and I mentioned it when I first got up here but the truth is the enemy in your life is rendered powerless through Jesus Christ the only power the enemy has is the power we give him when we agree with his lies we give him power when he lies to us and we don't stand on the truth then we hand over something to him that's not his because Jesus took it and got it and bought it for us. He paid the price for us. So we have power over the enemy unless we give it to him, and usually that's done by agreeing with him or walking outside of God's way. You know, no matter what comes our way, and this, this is hard because we, do, we go through hard times in life, and life is hard, but the truth is, when we really align ourselves with Jesus and with the truth of the gospel, with the truth of his word, the enemy has no power over us, no matter what swirls around us. I mean, if we really believe God and we believe that no matter what happens to us, that he really will turn all things together to, for good in our lives for those who love him, like that's a promise that we can hang on to in the middle of a severe storm. That is true, no matter what it is. When the enemy threatens us with the, with the loss of a loved one or, or when we actually lose a loved one, God is still God. He's still on his throne, and the Holy Spirit is still in you. You still have a destiny. He still has a plan for your life, and he will fulfill every single thing he has ever said in his word. And that is good news, and that is what the resurrection is all about. He didn't just come and die for our sins. He did. But he came so that we could live this victorious life in Christ Jesus. There is life after the cross. There's resurrected life after the cross. But before the cross, there's, before the resurrection, there's always a cross and always a death in order that there will be alive. So if the Lord is like putting something to death in you, it is only so that you can walk in the resurrected power in Jesus Christ. So whatever he's going after in your life and whatever you're having to die to, he brings the resurrection. He will bring resurrection in your life through that, through that very situation. That is a promise of God. Okay, Hebrews 2.16 he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Because of what he did, because he went on the cross, he was obedient, and he went on the cross and, and was resurrected, he, he rendered the enemy powerless, and it says he lives to make intercession for his children. So no matter what you're going through, God is with you, and Jesus is interceding for you. He lives to intercede for you. He's at the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for you. You are not alone. He was tempted in every way that you have been tempted, and he overcame. And we can hang on to his overcoming. Like, you're not out there on your own just trying to make it and survive and pass the test with God. 
He's with you in whatever you're going through. And he is your overcomer. He is the overcomer for you and in you. Hebrews 4, um, it says that he sympathizes with our weakness, so draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we receive um, that we receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. Like he went beyond the veil so that you could go beyond the veil and go straight to your father. In your time of need, he is there for you. Always. Talks in chapter 4 about taking hold of the hope that is set before you. This hope is Jesus. This hope is the anchor of our soul. It is a hope that is sure and steadfast and enters within the veil. You have a hope. You are a people you, that belong to God. You don't have to walk purposelessness, with purposelessness. You don't have to walk defeated. You don't have to walk beaten down. Because you have Jesus who is our hope. He is a steadfast and sure hope. And in verse 20 of chapter 4, it says that Jesus had entered as a forerunner, having come, having become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What Jesus did for us, all that he has is ours. That's so huge, really. He, he obeyed God and conquered death so that we could be like him so that we would be resurrected one day so that we he became the high priest it also the bible says we are priests and kings because of what jesus did we are priests and kings we have in jesus sonship daughtership we have a priest we are a priesthood a royal priesthood a holy nation this is good news. I'm going to just end with Romans 8. So if you want to turn to Romans 8. I will just say, like, I don't want to um, ditz Easter. You know, I know it's, it's something that we as Christians have celebrated for centuries and but I personally just for me I've just come to a place where I would rather celebrate the feast than celebrate Easter and and that's not to ditz Easter I'm just I'm just wondering if if sometimes we move away from the things God sets up like celebrate the Passover and celebrate these feasts we we the enemy kind of can trick us into well let's do this holiday and we'll throw in the bunny and the eggs and a new outfit and and the risen lord and i'm really i'm trying not to i don't want to be critical because i know easter is very special for some of you but but i guess what i want to say is it's not really about easter it's about the feast that the lord set up it's about passover it's about the wave sheaf offering it's about pentecost it's about tabernacles that's coming I mean, those are the feasts of the Lord. God said, these are my appointed times. I don't know who appointed Easter. But God says, I appointed these things. I appointed these things. And these are his feasts. So that's why when I was, like, emailing you all, I couldn't bring myself to say Easter. I just, like, it's Resurrection Day. I can go with that one. I just, you know, don't judge me. Anyway, <laughs> I might be uh, walking on holy territory there might be <laughs> yeah I could be walking on eggshells right there um, and 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 I know that that well I'll just stop there okay um, all right I'm just I'm gonna read starting with um, verse 16 of chapter 8 the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs. Okay, get this? You're not just a child, but because of what Jesus did, you're an heir. What does an heir get? He gets everything. Like, 
He gets everything. You're an heir to Jesus. Like, that was his love for you. Like, he loved you so much that he's like, I'm going to give them the most incredible inheritance and make them my heirs. He's awesome. Okay, so if, if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Your suffering is not in vain. A glory is coming. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. In who? Us. His glory is going to be revealed in us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Creation longs to see the glory of God revealed through you. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Like the earth is going to be set free from its bondage and its corruption into what? The freedom of the glory of the children of God. That is a life of purpose. That is worth it. That is what he came and conquered and did for us. We're heirs. We will inherit the earth. We are heirs. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit. There's that word again, first fruits. We got that at Pentecost. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The earth groans, we groan. We want out of this, but we know, don't you know you were meant for more than this? Don't we know, we, don't you feel frustrated sometimes by the hindrances of our flesh? That's because you weren't meant to stay in this. You were meant to be free from the bondage of the world. And so even we are groaning for something that is coming. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. We talk about faith a lot in the faith movement, but Hebrews 6 tells us we inherit the promises of God by faith and patience. We don't like that word. I've never heard of a patient movement, have you? But we, we wait with perseverance. We don't wait alone. We wait with Jesus. We persevere. We are waiting for something. We are persevering through something. We have a purpose. We have a destiny. Patience is just a demonstration of our faith. Verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes we just don't know how to pray, but the Spirit of God knows how to pray, and he groans. He makes intercession for you. He prays for you, and when you don't know, you say, I don't know, and ask the Spirit to pray through you, for you. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. This isn't talking about being predestined for hell or heaven. This is talking about you were predestined to be conformed to the image of God, and he usually gets his way. And it might take uh, some of us a little bit longer than others because we're stubborn or whatever. We don't want to cooperate. But God will not give up on you. He will not give up on you because you were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many. There's that first again. He's the firstborn of many sons, of which you and I are. And the, these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. He doesn't just save us. It says, he goes on, he will also glorify us. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say? What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? If God is for you, Evan, who is against you? No, nobody, no weapon forged against you will prevail. God is for us. So what will you say? Who is against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Jesus' death and resurrection what an inheritance we have. He will freely give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one that condemns you? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate you from the love of Christ will your tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword just as it is written for your sake we are being put to death all day long we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have a great king who laid his life down for us, and who came up out of the grave and conquered everything, even death. Death has no sting over his children. Praise be to God.